Hey guys, thanks for listening to our free podcast. We really appreciate it and we wanna keep it free for you. So we're gonna do it in a super easy way. It's just gonna take five seconds of your time. Go fill out the survey at tytnetwork.com slash podcast survey, super quick. And it helps us keep this podcast free. Thank you for listening and for participating. We really do appreciate it. Hey TYT, I'm Nomi Konst here in Washington DC, where we have a special guest today, author Tim Shorrock, who is also a contributor, a correspondent for The Nation, and Korea Center for Investigative Journalism, where your, your work will now be in English. Correct. And published to, to a larger audience. He's the author of Spies for Hire, The Secret World of the Intelligence Outsourcing, the privatization of, of, of US intelligence. US intelligence. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, so I, I North Korea, Rocket Man is in the news every day because of our, our eccentric president, President Trump. Um, there's been an escalation of tension between the two, two sides over the past you know, several months. Uh, you're an expert in, in politics of North Korea, uh, the diplomacy between <laughs> the two countries over the past few decades. But I, I wanna ask you, before we get into where we are right now, how did we even get here? You know, what's the history behind the tensions between North and South Korea and our relationship with North Korea? Well, as your viewers know, there was a Korean War mm -hmm. that started actually in the late 1940s, but it became a really hot war when North Korea invaded South Korea in 1950. And mm -hmm. that war raged for three years. It was a terribly destructive war. And uh, in the last two years of the war in particular, the United States completely controlled the skies and bombed North Korea to basically the Stone Age. I mean, there was nothing left. Mm -hmm. It was cinders. And every target was destroyed. And millions of people died. And you know, this was like you know, firebombing, napalm. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a terrible, terrible war. Calamity. Mm -hmm. And you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of homeless people. And you know, n North was completely shattered, destroyed. And North Korea has never quite forgotten that. And you know, the United States has had nuclear weapons on or near the pe Korean Peninsula for decades as well. The US finally pulled its nuclear weapons out of South Korea in 1991, but until then, there was hundreds of nu American nuclear weapons in the South you know, ready to be fired at North Korea at any moment. So they've been under you know, nuclear threat you know, all this time. Mm -hmm. The Korean War was not settled by a peace treaty like many wars are, and many, right. most wars should be. There was an armistice signed, but there was never a peace treaty. So there's still kind of a technical state of war. And so tensions between North and South have been very, very, you know, they've been gone up and down, but they've been pretty high since then. And the United States has maintained, you know, ten, you know right now there's like 28,000, but it used to be much higher uh, tr uh, troops on the south part of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, so it's always been, you know, very militarized. The mm -hmm. DMZ, the, the border between North and South, is probably the most militarized and most surveilled area in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, so there's the, the South and North Korea have gone through various phases in terms of their relationships. Uh, in the '70s, they began talking about unification again, uh, but then that that ended pretty abruptly. And and in, in South Korea, there was a two series of dic military dictators that were in power for many years and ran as draconia police state as North Korea runs now. You know, South Korea during a time of military rule was a uh, you know, terrible place as far as d democracy and human rights goes. And uh, so th those two military leaders uh, were in power for you know, decades. And uh, in, the, in the late 1990s, uh, uh, South Korea and North Korea began to soften, you know, the, the, there was a softening of relations mm -hmm. and there was an expansion of economic ties and, and cultural ties and other kinds of ties called the Sunshine Policy. Kim Dae Jung, who was the, the opposition leader. Right. And, and, but after two successive uh, progressive presidents in South Korea, uh, the right took over again in elections. And what was that? Uh, this was in, uh, well, there was a, Lee myung Buck was the first you know, conservative president elected for many mm -hmm. years. And then he was followed by Park geun hae who was the daughter of the former dictator, Park mm -hmm. Jung hee Park geun hae people might remember, was overthrown and impeached, mm -hmm. you know, this past year. Right. After, you know, 
protests that ran right. for weeks and weeks and weeks, which people in South Korea call the candlelight revolution. So there's a very strong, you know, uh, democracy uh, movement in, in South Korea, mm -hmm. very powerful uh, citizens movement, actually. Uh, and a lot of people there would like to move toward, you know, peaceful relations with North, North Korea. Uh, North sees the U.S. as its prime enemy. It sees itself surrounded by, you know, U.S. military forces both in South Korea and in Japan, mm -hmm. all around the whole region. And they, after, especially after certain things like uh, the U.S. invasion of Iraq uh, and the U.S. NATO bombing of Libya, right. Uh, they saw that the, they took the position that you know building nuclear weapons was their only way to have deterrence against the United States, mm -hmm. and so they've been steadily, especially in the last few years, under this young leader uh, Kim Jong Un, who's mm -hmm. only 33 years old, uh, they really focused on you know getting what they think is you know getting close to parity with the United States. And perfecting, or not perfecting, but you know, really trying to increase their mil missile capability, which they've done. You know, we mm -hmm. can see they've made incredible strides. And in, you know, ICBM, they apparently are very close to having an ICBM. They they could actually put a nuclear weapon on. They they're not quite there yet, but that's their intention. And they 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 want they to see that as the way to protect their nation from being invaded by the U.S. And then and when they get that kind of parity, they they will negotiate with the U.S. So, let's go back a second. Why, why wasn't there some sort of peace agreement? Why did they just set up an armistice? Which seems like that's that's sort of the root cause of where we are right now of all all of the tension mm -hmm. that there is a state of war that's continued. Well, basically, the South side, uh, you know, you know, the, uh, under the armistice, all foreign troops were supposed to be pulled out within a few mm. years. The U.S. you know never withdrew its forces. Right. Uh, the, 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 the Chinese forces in, you know, of course, the Korean War, the, the Chinese entered the war. And this was under Eisenhower? This was under Truman. Truman. Truman oh, was elect, Eisenhower was elected, you know, he, he actually went to Korea. He said, I'm going to, you know, end this war. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, under him is when the, the, the armistice was signed and the negotiations, you know, took place that, en let, that ended the war. But, uh, you know, you know, kind of like the, the, it's, it's unclear exactly, you know, who made the decision not to have a peace treaty, but it never happened. And the U.S. maintained its, its forces there. Wow. Chinese forces, you know, were you know, pulled out after about 10 years. The, the, the few Soviet forces that were there, they were mostly f flying uh, planes, were, you, hmm. know, you know, left. Uh, and so there was never, a, you know, a large foreign military contingent in North Korea. But, of course, you know, South Korea has been, you know, there's been you know, large uh, amounts of U.S. soldiers there you know, ever since the right. Korean War. Uh, so and who, are, who are the allies to North Korea right now? I mean, if things do escalate, who does North Korea rely on uh, for its assistance? Well, it's pretty, uh, in terms of military, it's pretty independent. You know? right. I mean, they, they do use you know, Chinese vehicles and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and they, but they've, they've developed their you know, the nuclear weapons and the missile technology by, well, you know, it began, you know, 20, 20, 25 years ago, mm -hmm. and they recruited, you know, Russian scientists that were, mm -hmm. after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was, you know, Russian nuclear scientists that were willing to work anywhere, and some of them, them helped develop in their early stages. Uh, they got technology from uh, Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, they got uh, and other technologies from China, mm -hmm. but you know they have you know close relations with China and right. fairly close relations with Russia also. Mm -hmm. uh, Chinese relations are kind of ta in tatters right now. Uh, there's a lot of talk here in the U.S. of like, well, if, if only the Chinese would, you know, press the North Koreans, this they could end this thing, and they, you know they should push the North Koreans to, you know, denuclearize and so on. But they, they don't have that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. um, North Korea is fairly independent. And does not like China telling it what to do. So where, where are they getting the money from? If there's no independent, no independent industry, and they're starving the resources of of their own people, um, I, I just don't understand. You know, putting together this type of, of military program or you know nuclear program, it's expensive. Well, the, you know, there's in the last few months, especially, there's been very severe sanctions imposed right. on the North Korean economy. And of course, those sanctions 
are aimed at you know cutting cutting its 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 international trade, mm -hmm. which is a lot of it, which is with China. So until these recent sanctions, they had you know fairly flourishing trade and in, in, you mm -hmm. know minerals like exporting coal and, and other kinds of minerals. There's a lot of very valuable minerals in North Korea. Mm -hmm. Has been it always has been, uh, and you know they've had manufacturing industries. They have. You know, yeah, yeah. They've they have they've actually had. You know, uh, actually, until the 19, late 1970s, after the Korean War, North Korea, you know, rebuilt, you know, quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, during the, especially the 70s and 80s, South Korea, of course, with lots of foreign capital, became a very, you know, powerful capitalist, you know, exporting economy. Mm -hmm. Um, but until the late 70s, actually, the North Korean economy, in terms of steel, machinery, you know, most in, in, in industrial indices, uh, were, were ahead of so mm -hmm. South Korea until the, this is about maybe early 70s. I remember there was a CIA report in the early 70s that said North Korea was ahead of South Korea mm -hmm. in all those areas. Uh, and then, of course, you know, South Korea just shot up, and now there's almost no comparison between the mm -hmm. between the two economies. So, you know, they've had, uh, you know, the the you know, a lot of people also today say, uh, a lot of times in doing interviews like this, you have to shoot down a lot of these uh, misconceptions about North Korea. People there are not starving. There was a famine mm -hmm. that lasted until the you know the end of the 1990s, but they pretty much recovered from that. Uh, I mean, which is not to say there's there's not malnutrition, but it's not like you know people are starving in the streets like they they were at one point. So uh, those documentaries that have come out about mm -hmm. North Korea are are would you say they're misleading? Uh, most of them are very misleading. What's the why? Why would they have? Well, the thing is, like you can't you can't you can't go to North Korea and. Um, you know, do the kind of reporting you can do here or South Korea, or, you know, mm -hmm. in most countries. It's mm -hmm. very carefully controlled. It's very difficult to, you know, talk to ordinary people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and a lot of documentary makers, you know, kind of go in there with a certain kind of, you know, um, political purpose and they want to expose s some things. So, I mean, there's, there's certain truths to them, but I mean, it's, it's very difficult to go in there and do a documentary where you get, where you really gather the truth because mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty much hidden when you, when you go there. And it's not a place that's open for journalists. Right. And you're, it's very controlled. You talk to any, you know, recent crews that have been there from the, say, the, you know, in the last you know, couple of weeks, last month, North Korea has been inviting Wall Street Journal, you know, New right. York Times. They have bureaus uh, you know, there. Some AP, of them. Uh, AP has a bureau. AP does, yeah. And uh, who else has a bureau? AP, I think Reuters does not, but AP does. CNN does. CNN, CNN right. CNN has a pretty good reporter there, you right. know. And he's able to, he's a, he's a, he occasionally can get some, some very interesting interviews there. Um, but, you know, the, the fact is it's, it's, it's pretty closed. And, you know, I think, I think that's one of the, one of the, problems and one of the tragedies really because um, you know in 1994 uh, there was when the sort of the first nuclear crisis happened when they left the nuclear non-proliferation treaty and said they were going to go ahead and start building the nuclear mm -hmm. capability uh, and the United States under President Clinton mm -hmm. uh, was considering a, a military strike on their one nuclear facility at Yongbyon that's mm -hmm. where, what it's called and Jimmy Carter, the former president, uh, flew there, met with Kim Il-sung, who was the grandfather of the current leader, and they worked out a deal, and then it, it eventually became known as the uh, 1994 uh, uh, agreed framework. Mm -hmm. And North Korea actually stopped its nuclear program for a, de a decade, basically. Wow. Actually, 12 years, they, they did not produce any plutonium. And that agreement actually held for a few years until it kind of blew up during the Bush administration. Why, why, why did it happen during the Bush administration? Was it because of Well, Iraq? what happened was, uh, I mean, there's, there's sort of two steps in it. And this is very important to understand, you know, the, the current history. Mm -hmm. Because tr President Trump and a lot of his people, and, and in fact, you know, a lot of commentators will say, You'll see. Uh, you'll turn on CNN, and they'll say, "Yeah, the U.S. signed an agreement with them in 1994, and the North Koreans broke it the next day," which is not true. Hmm. They actually held it. Uh, there was long. You know, the U.S. supplied them with uh, fuel oil mm -hmm. to, because they shut down one nuclear facility, 
And, and then okay. the U.S. said they would supply them with 500,000 tons a year of fuel oil mm -hmm. for their power plants, as well as build, help build, and finance uh, two light water nuclear reactors for their power grid. Mm -hmm. That was part of the deal. The light water reactors are considered less, you know, they're more able to, you know, create bombs out of the, mm -hmm. out of the uh, fuel that comes out of nuclear power plants. So they were building light water plants. Uh, and North Korea, like I said, stopped producing plutonium. Mm -hmm. And then uh, out of this agreement, uh, they were, missiles were not part of that agreement. And North Korea was still developing its own missiles. Uh, in around 1998, uh, President Clinton asked his defense secretary at the time to open negotiations with them on missiles. And by the end of the Clinton administration, uh, Bill Perry was the defense secretary. They were like this far away from an agreement on missiles where North Korea was going to mm -hmm. stop producing and end its missile program. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Bush came in and, you know, Bush came in with a lot of these neoconservatives who, who had these very, you know, aggressive plans for, you know, the United States and foreign policy. And uh, they were against this agreed framework from the beginning. People like John Bolton, who mm -hmm. was the UN ambassador at the time. I mean, they just thought the agreement was, you know, a sellout and, and, and uh, you know, should be trashed. And they took the very first opportunity they could to trash this agreement, which happened in 2002. The Bush administration sent a uh, State Department negotiator, actually it wasn't a negotiator, official there, and they had picked up intelligence that the U.S. had known about actually for some time that the North Koreans might be building a uranium program to the bomb. They stopped their plutonium program, but then the and U.S. intelligence picked up signs that they were buying equipment, you know, uh, for, uh, for to enrich uranium to, to to go that route for a bomb. Uh, at the time, and this was October 2002, uh, Jim Kelly, the, the the State Department official who went there. His talking, his orders from Bush and, and Cheney were just to deliver a message that we know you've been doing this and the, the, the agreement is over. You know, we're, we're, we're going to cancel the agreement because of that. And he was given no authority to negotiate whatsoever. Now, at that time, North Korea said they did not have a uranium program, but they said they had a right to have one and they would be willing to negotiate it. But the, the U.S., you know, the, his, the orders were not to negotiate. And, and as a result of that, uh, the U.S., you know, and a couple months later, Bush put North Korea on the list of the axis of Excellent. evil and everything, you know, sort of, you know, it, it became very, very tense. North Korea, you know, ended the agreement as well. And by 2006, they had exploded their first bomb. They they built a bomb out of the uh, you know they started re, you know making plutonium and, and made, putting it into a bomb and by 2006 they had done it. So what was the intention so, of the neocons? I mean, it just seems like it would naturally evolve to that state by being so so bold in, in actions. I, I to me I, I it's almost like you see Trump today and, and John Bolton is I would say outside of the mainstream. Very by much so. Standards. Yeah. Um, so tactics like this, at a at a point when it seemed like there was no reason, what was their reasoning? Well, remember the neocons were like, you know, if if there is any sign, you know, Cheney's theory was if there's a one percent chance that someone will attack you, then you then you take military action, right? Yeah. With the one percent solution, the famous Cheney one percent okay. solution. So you know they invaded Iraq and they made basically made up the evidence that they had weapons of mass destruction, which we now know they did not. Uh, so they were you know it was a kind of a domination, dominationist kind of aggressive philosophy, mm -hmm. and so they they saw North Korea as an enemy. We should never have negotiated with them. Uh, we should never have you know taken up this this agreement. We never should have signed this agreement. And and so they you know they just they saw North Korea as enemy and mm -hmm. and part of the, the 1994 agreement that was very important to the North Korean side was that you know both the U.S. and North Korea agreed to normalize their move toward full normalization, mm -hmm. full political and economic normalization. And at that that at the time you know like when the when the agreement was signed, uh, the the leader of North Korea then was Kim Jong Il, who is the son of. Kim Jong of Kim Il Sung, the founder, right? right. They have this uh, rather strange hereditary 
communist dictatorship where it goes from son to son, you know, father to son to son. Uh, but 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 he was basically uh, trying to trade uh, North Korea's uh, uh, future, and he was willing to give up you know, nuclear weapons and willing to give up his missiles in exchange for a normal relationship mm -hmm. with the United States. I mean, this was in the, in the, in the mid-90s, right? And only a few years before the Soviet Union had collapsed. Mm -hmm. So North Korea was, you know, had lost a very close ally because they, 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 they no longer got, like, for example, they no longer got inexpensive oil from the Soviets. Mm -hmm. And a lot of its natural markets in the socialist countries in Eastern Europe was also cut off mm -hmm. because all those countries you know, went, you know, th th went, went, went capitalist as well. And mm -hmm. so North Korea was at that time you know, quite isolated. And so Kim Jong-il saw this as a way to help his country and his regime survive by giving up these weapons. And he was willing to trade away the weapons for, for a relationship with the United States. And this, and they were actually moving toward, you know, North Koreans came here. Uh, I mean, this is how good relations were with North Korea under under Clinton. In 2000, the number three man in the North Korean leadership, a, a very high-ranking military person, and the number two person to Kim Il, Kim Jong Il, actually came to Washington, met at the White House with Bill Clinton, and they signed an agreement, basically a non-aggression agreement and to move toward full normalization. And this missile agreement was going to be signed uh, right at the end, you know, was going to be signed. Um, actually, Secretary of State Albright went to Pyongyang, met with Kim Jong-il, and they, they mapped out the basic outlines of this agreement. And then, you know, the election happened when, you know, Gore and Bush, you know, was in the Supreme Court, and mm -hmm. Clinton decided he was going to go to North Korea. He didn't go. And so the agreement was never signed. Which, oh, was wow. very, which was very unfortunate because when Bush came in with this aggressive, you know, uh, po policy, uh, they, they, you know, from the very first, Bush said, we don't trust the North Koreans, we're not going to negotiate with them. Mm -hmm. And so the North said, okay, you know, we, we, we thought we had this agreement, we're just going to go ahead with our weapon systems and start building, you know, nuclear. Mm -hmm. So like I said, 2006, they exploded their first bomb. And amazingly... Three weeks after they exploded their first bomb, Bush authorized negotiations with them. And they opened, you know, to his credit, actually. President Bush actually negotiated, you know, for a few years under, at that time it was called, they had, they expanded these negotiations to include other countries in the region. It was mm -hmm. called the Six Party Talk. So Japan was part of it, Russia, China, South Korea, and the U.S., and North Korea, of course. So, you know, Flash forward, it's it's been 11 years since since then. Um, right. And we're at this state where, you know, even our own government has mixed beliefs on what Donald Trump is doing. We, we had a conversation before we came on about what would happen if Donald Trump made a real declaration of war against North Korea or did something that escalated the situation even more so that, um, you know, perhaps they did launch some sort of nuclear attack. How would leadership in the military? I mean, I, I imagine, even though the military is sort of lockstep, I, I'm. Why would anybody back such an outrageous policy? Would anybody go rogue? Would there be any leadership, um, down level, you know, that would prevent these sort of actions from happening? Well, at the, at the highest level, like if he ordered a nuclear strike, hopefully, you know, or it was contemplated when hope, hopefully someone around him would 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 give him some words of caution on that. Right. But I don't know, seeing how these people have been acting in the last few days, even like, you know, General Kelly and what the yeah. Keynes, he says, I'm not sure about that. Right. But but uh, I think within the military itself, it's important to remember, like, you know, we've had tens of thousands of troops in South Korea and the, and mm -hmm. the Army, U.S. Army is the biggest force there, is the largest number of, of American soldiers are from the U.S. Army. I mean, there's, 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 there's Marines in Japan and Okinawa and so on, but it's U.S. Army that, that's in Korea. They're not, not, there used to be Marines fought during the Korean War, but anyone who goes through the Army and becomes a you know, top officer and, and general spends time in Korea. And they all know the geography of Korea. They know the politics of Korea. And they know what a war would mean. 
Hmm. And they, a lot of them, especially you know, older generals who know the Korean War, know what a, just a terrible, terrible war it was. I mean, America lost, you know, something like 38,000, almost 40,000 Americans were killed. I mean, there was like maybe 3 million Koreans were killed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, who, a hundred, few hundred thousand Chinese were killed. But they know what a horrendous war it was. And it's very mountainous, very difficult terrain to fight a war. And, and so, like, you know, a lot of military people are not, not excited at all about having a war. And anyone who's a strategic planner in the military, I mean, mm -hmm. look how far extended we are now. You know, we're still fighting a major war in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. you know, uh, fighting ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Uh, you know, there's this, there's, you know, massive military buildup in the Pacific to encircle China. Mm -hmm. I mean, a war in Korea would, would, would involve, you know, all of the military. And so I think, and when, when you know, it killed tens of thousands, mm -hmm. if not millions of people. So a lot of military people mm -hmm. understand that. And if you're in the Marines, and you're a general like General Mattis was a Marine general. I mean, the Marines had one of their biggest defeats in the Korean War. Mm -hmm. You know, they, and the Marines were sent, you know, way, they actually invaded North Korea and they were sent way north toward the border and that's when the Chinese entered and the Chinese encircled the Marines. And you know, <laughs> many, many Marines died in North Korea, and they, they, they had this amazing uh, you know, withdrawal. They were able to get out of the mountains. It was freezing cold, and they were able to get out and get to a port and get evacuated. But it was, you know, it was a terrible ordeal. And so you know, Marines know this, and US right. people in the military know this. And, and they know how close Seoul is to the DMZ, and how, how, how you know, if there's any, you know, if, if Trump, I mean, there was a, uh, Tae Young Ho, who is his highest level defector from North Korea, has been here in Washington this week. And he spoke the other day at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and he testified at the House Foreign Affairs Committee yesterday. And he said, I mean, he's somebody who, you know, wants the, a new government in North Korea. He would mm -hmm. like to have, you know, a, 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 a democratic replacement for the Kim Jong, Kim Jong Un regime there. But he said if there was a he testified this, and he spoke about it quite eloquently, actually, that if there was a, an attack by the U.S., a preemptive attack, it would result in, um, you know, many, many deaths. And, you know, North Korea, he noted all the artillery that North Korea has on the border. So I, I think a lot of military people are not, you know, would not want a war. If they're ordered to go to war, of course they would. It's their, it's their job. Right. But, but uh, I think... The, the problem with Trump is that he has made it very personal with Kim Jong-un, you know, like, you know, you it's call psychological. It, right. Yeah, yeah. It's like and so like, you know, Kim Jong-un his whole the whole propaganda machine in North Korea is like, you know, we're under threat from the United States. That's why we have these missiles to protect us and these mm -hmm. nuclear weapons to protect us. And then when, you know, Trump actually goes to the U.N., and makes a speech to the General Assembly and says, you know, if, if they threaten us, we're going to totally destroy North Korea. That's all he has, Kim Jong-un, all he has to do is show that tape and, and makes his point. So it, it, just, it just feeds into this, this image that they have of the United States ready to, right. to, you know, when you say totally destroy a country, you're talking about 25 million people. You know, that's genocide. I mean, right. the, the, we're, we're talking about, you know, mass, mass murder casualties. And, and, and so, you know, that's what's dangerous. And also, you know, f flying, you know, strategic bombers, B-1, B bombers up the, up the coast across mm -hmm. Korean skies, you know, with, with, with these very, very advanced fighter planes that are based in Japan and South Korea accompanying them and doing, you know, this kind of show of force. Uh, it's, it, right now we, we're in a situation, and of course the North Koreans testing their missiles, mm -hmm. and, and there's this, you know, very high level of tension. In that kind of situation, it's really easy for someone to make a mistake and, and to make a misjudgment. And that's what's dangerous. Okay, so Donald Trump is now heading to Korea. Right. Is this to troll Kim Jong-un? What's the point of this trip? Well, he's going to Japan, too. He's going to the Philippines. And, you know, he's going to try to, I guess, solidify his Asia policies, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of ironic because he's hardly have any, there's hardly anybody in place in the State that's Department right. Or even the Defense Department, he just, you know, has made some, um, uh, put some people in place in the last couple of days, made some appointments in the last couple of days, <laughs> but there's still no ambassador to South Korea. 
which is terrible during this during this time of you know crisis, not to have a U.S. ambassador there. Uh, uh, so you know this has been planned for a while, but I think his first stop is going to be in Japan, where the prime minister there, Abe, is very hawkish and is is you know very right wing and kind of a militarist. He wants to change the Japanese peace constitution to allow Japanese military forces to take part in you know wars overseas. Basically, that, that's what he's, that's his big push. And he ran on a campaign, you know, that because North Korea had recently shot missiles over Japanese skies uh, in their t- testing of their missiles. You know, he ran a campaign uh, based largely on the they consider the North Korean threat mm-hmm. and actually his, you know, defense minister thanked North Korea after they won their sweeping election victory. You know, North Korea is, you know, responsible for our victory. So he's very hawkish. Trump likes him. He all, Trump always talks to Abe when there's a mm-hmm. Korea crisis as, as opposed to talking to the South Korean president. Uh, you know, I think Trump, you know, prefers people who have share his politics uh, but I think, you know, he, he's been making these these kinds of, of course, he's been, you know, these tweets that he's kind of seems to have stopped on North Korea, mm-hmm. but who knows what he will say. And he, he's very belligerent in his language. Right. And, you know, it not only scares, you know, North Korea and can make, draw a lot of concern about what his intentions are in North Korea, but a lot of people in South Korea, you know, when I was living in South Korea this past spring, I was there in April and May, uh, I was I was not living in Seoul. I was living in the city of Gwangju, which is in the in the southwest. Uh, but you know, people are far more concerned about what Trump might do than Kim Jong Un. Mm. People in South Korea are not really they don't really think North Korea is going to invade South Korea again mm. or anything like that. They're concerned that Trump will start a war that, of course, would involve South Korea. And that, you know, that's the biggest fear in South Korea. It's still a you know a, a, you know a major fear there. And so I think, you know, Trump is the way he's cranked up this crisis and, and really intensified uh, the situation with, with his threats and, and, you know, saying I'm going to totally destroy North Korea. This kind of language mm-hmm. uh, is, is not the kind of language you use if you're trying to get someone to the negotiating table, mm-hmm. for one thing. Uh, so I think it's, 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 it's a dangerous situation. And, you know, who knows uh, what he's what he's going to be saying. But it, apparently in South Korea, his big visit's going to be, you know, to the big U.S. base there. This, actually, the United States is just finishing construction of what's going to be the largest US, U.S. military base in the entire world at this city called Pyeongtaek, south of Seoul. Uh, it's called Camp Humphreys, and it's a gigantic, gigantic U.S. military base. And that's where he's going. And of course, he's going to be met by some demonstrations in South Korea. You know, peace groups, labor groups, um, you know, other other kinds of you know democratic opposition groups are going to be out in the streets, you know, protesting his his you know his um, you know militant posture toward mm-hmm. North Korea and the dangers of war. We don't want they don't want war. They don't want a Trump war. You know, they they they, they don't want to welcome Trump to South Korea. So a lot of people there. If you had uh, President Trump's ear and he was in a reasonable place, uh-huh. what advice would you give him to de-escalate the situation to get us out of, out of this catastrophe right now? I would say uh, send Secretary of State Tillerson to Pyongyang mm-hmm. uh, to meet with the North Korean leadership with no preconditions. You know, don't you can't come into negotiations and say you have to surrender first, which is basically what they what they say in terms of like North Korea has to denuclearize first. Well, go in there with a no preconditions and talk about what's possible to talk about. Right. What North Korea keeps saying over and over again uh, is that I mean they, they they do say publicly they will not negotiate away their nuclear weapons. They say they're, they 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 want to be recognized as a nuclear state. However, they also say in every statement they make. They want the U.S. to end its hostile policy. They use this term over and over again. So, in other words, the United States, uh, if it wants to de-escalate the situation and end this crisis, it needs to address North Korea's security concerns. Mm-hmm. They're concerned that the U.S. You know, is ready to invade them, is ready to bomb them, is ready to attack them. And th- that's what all these you know, military exercises are aimed at. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I would say... You know, send send Tellerson or some high level person to, to actually start talking to them. Mm-hmm. But you have to start. You have to begin with talks about what you are going to negotiate about. 
but just come in there and like you know so so at least there's some contact right uh you know going back to this issue of not having a u.s ambassador in south korea it's also it's also unfortunate that we don't i mean there's no reason not to have diplomatic relations with north korea i mean you know, we had diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union from 1933 on under, under a, you know, a, a leader, Stalin, who was, you know, very oppressive leader. I mean, there's no reason not to have diplomatic relationships mm -hmm. with countries that you, you know, you, you're, you're fundamentally at odds with. So uh, it, it's un, there's, so there's no contact between the U.S. and North Korea. I mean, apparently there's been, you know, some minimal contact between the, uh, the there's a there's a sort of U.S. ambassador at large who's responsible Joseph Yuen, who's responsible for talks with North Korea on the issue of human rights. But he is actually, you know, he's he, this year he's met with North Korean officials several times in Europe, a couple times in Europe, and then in New York where the North Koreans have a UN UN mission to the mm -hmm. to the United Nations. Um, so so that would be my advice is you know. You know, for right. God's sake, start talking to them. I mean, the, the longer this goes on, the worse it gets. And you know, so you need to you need to know what what their United States need to hear directly from North Korea right. about what their concerns are, what they want from the U.S. and vice versa. How likely do you see there potentially being a North Korean spring? Uh, I don't see that as very likely. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I mean, I think. You know, obviously, you know, there's very highly educated people there. Um, you know, this 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 uh, former this defector who was in Washington this week. He mm -hmm. was the deputy North Korean ambassador to to, to the UK to, mm -hmm. in London, mm -hmm. and he also served in Sweden and other countries in Europe. And he was a negotiator with the EU, EU on human rights issues. Mm -hmm. You know, from like 2001. Uh, so he's erudite, you know, uh, you know, accomplished, uh, you know, very well versed in world politics. Uh, so there's a lot of elite people like that that you know that know about the world. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, North Koreans are cut off from you know communication with the world. I mean, they, they haven't, they do have internet, but it's intranet. It's only you know it's, it's controlled inside yeah. of North Korea. Um, like I was saying before, there's, you know, it's not like this really backward country. I mean, they have fairly advanced technology mm -hmm. there. So, you know, people use computers and so on. But, but there's not uh, communication with, with the outside. Uh, it's very, very, very controlled. Uh, so, you know, they, they learn about the outside world by, you know, watching, you know, things that, you know, soap operas on South Korean TV. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they get... They, they, they get um, devices to put in their computers to watch mm -hmm. South Korean TV and outside but it's they're cut off and, and there's no sign of you know mass unrest there uh, I, you know I think there's there's clearly people uh, that are capable of of you know taking North Korea in a different direction um, but you know the the propaganda system there you know begins at a very early age when they're where they're taught you know, Americans are the devil, basically, and are you know, uh, out to kill them all, um, which is why I think that it's, it's sad that the U.S. Congress uh, cut off all U.S. travel to North Korea, mm. because I think the only way North Korea is going to change is if its people are, uh, you know, subject to, you know, meeting people from outside of right. North Korea and, and outside ideas. And if you just completely cut that off, they're going to be, you know, much more isolated than they've ever been. Right. So um, I don't see a sign of that. I think I think that uh, one of the interesting things uh, this this uh, defector, uh, Mr. Tay, was talking about the other day was, you know, he said if there is a, you know, after the Arab Spring, um, and the and the intervention in Libya, mm -hmm. uh, it's like the UN and NATO both sort of approved. This so-called humanitarian intervention, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this was this was big with the Obama administration and his people. You know, when when you intervene in a country to prevent a humanitarian catastrophe, that was the justification for Absolutely. the Libya bombing, yeah. right? Uh, and of course, the situation became a lot worse after that. But you know, Kim Jong Un saw this. This is right when he you know was coming to power at a very young age, and uh, the ambassador the other day was was talking about. If there was a revolt, similar kind of revolt in North Korea, he would, you know, he would put it down. I mean, the, 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 he would put it down mercilessly. But what he's concerned about is 
the, that the world, the U.S., or, you know, NATO might might see that as a reason for this so-called humanitarian intervention. Mm -hmm. And if he has nukes, nuclear weapons yeah. that 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 you know protects him right. and protects his regime and protects his you know family and power. Uh, so that, that's that's probably true. But but like for decades, you know, you, you read people here in Washington that say, you know, South North Korea is going to collapse, you know, in, in two years or something. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's a much more uh, complex uh, society than, than, than people here imagine. And, you know, I think, I think this, the sense of loyalty they've cultivated uh, toward their so-called great leader, mm -hmm. uh, great leaders, and the, and his family is very strong. It's almost you know it's very kind of religious like right. in some ways, uh, and, and and that would take a, you know a lot to 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 erode. And and you know you can learn a lot about this. This is why, you know, in some sense uh, the you know interviews with defectors is important because uh, the, the ones that are not trying to exaggerate their 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 experience. The ones that are sort of trying to in South Korea and made some in the United States trying to live a normal life, you know, a lot of times they will defend certain policies of North Korea mm -hmm. while you know criticizing, you know, the, the the lack of opportunity, the lack of information, and this kind of right. thing. So they, they you know, there That's are people there that have a fairly sophisticated analysis of the world and their own situation. And so, you know, I think that rather than, you know, wait for a collapse or some kind of, you know, Korea, North Korea spring, uh, it, it's better to try to work toward a you know, peaceful resolution of this conflict and the war, right. get a peace treaty. And, and you know, if, 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 if North Korea uh, can be in a situation where, you know, it, you know, maybe uh, stops its nuclear program or freezes it, uh, and then in exchange, you know, get economic support from South Korea and the United States. You know, it could be gradually, it could gradually, you know, you know, come out of its shell, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's how you would get, you know, change. I mean, our experience with, you know, uh, communist countries like the Soviet Union and countries in Eastern Europe and Cuba, for example, mm -hmm. you know, when there's stability, uh, over time, there can be there can be internal change. I mean, you know, look at Cuba. They used to jail gay people, mm -hmm. gay and lesbians, mm -hmm. and transgender people. You know, but right. now they, now they celebrate gay, lesbian, transgender. Right. You know, it's 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 a it's been a big change. So, you know, change is possible within socialist countries. I mean, we've seen it all over you know Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. In fact, we've seen it in some places in Eastern Europe where it's moved you know toward fascism. You know? Right. But but I mean, there can be. There can be change, and but I think you know right now in North Korea's you know political system and is so rigid and controlled that it's very difficult to see anything like that. I can only hope. Yeah. He's thirty-three years old. Yes, he's a long way ahead, <laughs> long a long life, and hopefully, uh, you know, he'll see the light, or there'll be some way that the the North Korean people can feel liberation, and and we don't. Um, escalate this any further well I, I think the important thing here is south korea because you right. know people you know, you, like i was saying before the show you know every south korean practically has family in north korea and, right. and of course north koreans have family in south korea so you know th there have been some family reunions over the years but not very many mm. and i think i think for a lot of people in korea they want to have some kind of you know unification mm -hmm. you know, whether it they don't quite know what form it might take, but they want this conflict to end, and they want to have you know friendly relations with their relatives and family in North Korea, and that's why you know when Trump says things like he's going to totally destroy North Korea, he have all these South Koreans that have family there. Right. Well, there are Koreans. This has been one nation for five thousand years, so it was arbitrarily divided mm -hmm. at the end of World War II, and you know people pine for the days when you could have they could have a united Korea again. So, you know, I think uh, left to their own devices, North and South Korea could actually work, work, work this out mm -hmm. if there was a peace treaty and, and the, the, the military threat was, was greatly reduced, then there could be exchanges in this kind of slow integration, I think. That would bring the peace, I think. And it's really a, change things in North Korea. It's a very progressive way of looking at it. So 
hopefully yep. we'll be there in a couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, thank you I very much. So. I thank appreciate you. it. Thanks a lot. All right. If you like the interview that you just watched, I got great news for you. If you become a Young Turks member, you can watch them live as they happen. Only the members get that. You also get uh, Young Turks live. You also get Aggressive Progressive live and Old School live. Everything is available for the members and commercial free. tytnetwork.com slash join.